he was faced with a lot of issues. One, this boy was born with a very severe cleft. No, and I'm sure you guys have seen that in, in your life of people being born cleft. And the offset of the nose and the breathing complications and the speech complications and just all these complications that goes along with that. And this boy was born to a young parent, young parents, very young, 18 and 20. And the parents was faced with an issue that just really floored them because this little boy was, uh, you know, he had a deformity. So this little boy was actually turned over to his grandparents. And as his grandparents began to raise him with the nurture of true love of a parent. And then later on in life, two years later, this grandparent had this kid back to the parents and they began this long journey of repetitive surgeries. And I mean surgery after surgery after surgery. But the most dramatic part about this boy was that this boy began to get a self-image of himself that he didn't fit in. And as he didn't fit into society, and on the playground, this kid was kicked, hard, spit upon. Special occasions would come that reading would come along and this kid would be pulled out of the classroom. And as he's leaving, there goes Ritardo. But the kid just found his refuge in hiding away from society. He would build tents at home and would come home and cry in the tent of not ever fitting in. This kid had an image of himself that was just horrible. And along with that, he began to question, why God? Why God? Why did you do this to me, God? What did I do, God, to deserve this? At the age of 18, this young boy found his way so-called in the religious system of getting saved. But along with getting saved came exactly what he was talking about this morning, a lot of the baggage. Because as I tell you this story, I am that boy. I am that kid that was born 39 years ago that was severe cleft, that carried this image. And in this meeting of all this week, we've heard from these two men and from Gary about the love of God. And I love how he brought that out this morning about the grave clothes being wrapped around. I was at the feet of Jesus, but I carried such heartache toward, I, I, oh, I was mad. I carried an anger because why, God, even though I was corrected, I still had this self-image of myself as being this freak, being the retarded, being the stupid one. Look at Frankenstein. Look at Metal Mouth. Look at Frankenstein's head. Kick, hit. I carried this anger. Even though I met and gave my heart to God when, as so-called religion would say, at the age of 18, it wasn't until years later that I had to get rid of this image. And I was never will forget it. I was sitting at my table. And the reason why I want to tell you this is because I think a lot of us sitting in here tonight even hold God at something in our life. Was it maybe you were raped? Maybe you were abused? Maybe you're an alcoholic? Maybe you're this? We can label, we can sit here all night and make a whole list of labels. And, but maybe there's that one area of your life that you're actually holding God. Why, God? And I want to share to you my experience, because number one, tribulation work of patience, patience experience, experience hope. And with that hope comes that love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And I, I had the love shed through all of these experiences, but I had to break that bond of death that, that I carried with me. And I want to tell you what God has done to me one morning, and I want to share it with you in this experience. The experience was this. I was sitting at the table and God said, declare to me a jubilee. Did I hear this right? You, God, want me to give you a jubilee? Declare to me a jubilee. I said, I don't understand this, God. Jubilee, if you don't know what true jubilee is, let me give you just a little illustration. Jubilee was the, the year of the release. It came every 50th year. They blow the trumpet, and, and I'm sure all of us in here would actually know what Jubilee is. But if, if somebody had owed me so much, they, they would bring their family on my farm, and they would pay this debt off. But if, say if they were going to work for 10 years, but during the 10 years, the seven 
See, in the seventh or fifth year, the, the year of Jubilee, I had to release them. Get that. Release them unto their own possession. And God said, Darren, you have held me accountable. And if you give me a jubilee, you free me to go to my own possession, and it's you I need to possess. So when I thought about that, I'm like, wait a minute. I have held him accountable. I have held him in bondage. Yes. But when I declared that jubilee that day, and I said, okay, God, I give you the jubilee. He told me to go do something very strange. He said, now go look at yourself in the mirror. I had the most hardest time in my life looking in the mirror. Because I went through this transformation, even though my nose, my lip, my upper pilot, everything, I had to learn to speak. Even though I had to learn that, I still had the image I could not look into that mirror. It was devastating. And the day I went to that mirror, and I looked in that mirror, and he said, scratch your right ear. And I just done this, put it down. He says, you didn't get it. Scratch your right ear. Scratch it again. He says, notice the image in the mirror, Darren. It is actually the left ear that the image was scratching. I see you from the inside, not from the outside. <laughs> that is how we learn to let go. It's to really learn that it's in here because this young man that carried all of that heartache toward my parents, toward society, toward my classmates, was totally delivered. Yes, I may, I can't remember, I can think back on the things, but the total deliverance of releasing God to a jubilee yes. to possess me right. has changed my life. And today, if you will only declare a jubilee in your life, you'll see deliverance of whatever's holding you. All right. All right. All right. All right.